Okay, thank you to those who are joining us for this important webinar tonight. Um, just going to give it a few minutes, obviously, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows the routine by now, why we're um, letting participants into the meeting. And then um, as soon as that settles down a bit, then we'll get going as soon as possible. So apologies if I do repeat a few things as people come in. Um, but we will um, be taking questions. So we'll be hearing from Paul and then taking questions and encouraging people to put those in the, the Q&A, preferably if you want to introduce yourself, please do use the chat function um, as well. But obviously that's harder for us to monitor for questions. So do encourage you to use Q&A function where possible for specific questions. So just give it one more minute, I think, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, that, that looks like um, most people who are in now. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, really good to see such a huge number for what we hope is going to be um, the first in a series of webinars over the, the coming weeks, specifically, specifically around the issue of nuclear power. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Sam Mason. Um, I'm a member of CND and on the CND General Council. I'm also a trade unionist. And this webinar is being organized by our trade union subgroup um, within CND um, to particularly look at some of the issues of, of nuclear power and obviously how that impacts workers. Um, but this first webinar, which I think is very timely, nuclear power, not fit for purpose. Um, we're very pleased to welcome Paul Dorfman along, who are introduced shortly. But it's particularly timely, obviously, in the context of what we see happening in Ukraine, the energy crisis, and um, for those who've had time to catch up with the news today, the third report from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which um, themselves was a, a series of three reports giving a serious analysis on climate change. Um, so we had Code Red for Humanity last August. We had the Atlas of Human Suffering just in, in February. And this is the third one, which of course um, is, is about the, the, the steps we need to take very urgently to combat climate change. Um, and obviously, as we've seen, the government's response, some of the energy um, crisis has been to look at ramping up um, nuclear power um, with plant and small modular reactors. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to Paul Doffman, who's going to speak for about 20 minutes. And um, Paul is an academic um, expert, and he's going to brief us on the, the subject particularly around the um, the design of the um, EDF reactor, the, the EPR, which he can say much more about far more eloquently, eloquently than me. Um, and to say Paul is an associate fellow in the science policy research unit at the University of Sussex and chair of the nuclear consulting group and member of the Irish government environment protection agency and a member of the Radiation Protection Advisory Committee. So um, I will hand over to Paul for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll um, come back to some uh, Q&A session. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you and CND for inviting me. And as you say, at this sort of key moment, um, I've constructed a, a lovely PowerPoint with some really nice pictures and you know, some all of the references that you could possibly want, but for some reason, sorry, for some reason, I, I can't manage to uh, share it with you. So I'm going to have to talk it through with you. Hope it's not too boring. And then uh, CMD will publish it. So we'll be able to see all of the nice pictures and more importantly, uh, all of the references uh, attached to. Uh, uh, so you'll be able to fact check, basically, the things that I'm saying. Because as we know now, uh, the, you know, the key to so much is, is speaking truth to, to power. Uh, okay, now the first uh, image that I have, the first sentence that I have is that it, it may get worse before it gets better. And there's an image of, of a kind of rather disreputable looking Tintin uh, drinking scotch and looking hungover. 
but you have to, to wait to see that. It's nice to start with a, with a, with a laugh. Um, the next one is unfortunately an image of, um, is an image of, uh, uh, of, of um, Oops, a day. Ah. So I Paul, we, we seem to have you on the screen twice. Your name has come up twice, so I don't know if there's some technical problem. Yeah, getting some feedback there, which obviously you can hear yourself. Yes. You'll, you'll need to come off one device, Paul, but I don't want to kick you out in case I kick you both out. Can you hear us? Oh, I think we've lost Paul. Okay, sorry about this, everybody. Um, as you probably gathered from the start, Paul's having a, a few technical problems his end at the moment. Um, so we're obviously trying to get Paul back as quickly as possible so we can continue with the with the webinar. And I think I've, I've seen a, a couple of people have asked about the slides that Paul was going to show, and certainly they will be distributed with the recording of the webinar um, from CND once that's um, put out afterwards. And hopefully we will get Paul back to continue with his presentation. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. OK, Paul is just connecting, so hopefully we uh, won't have to wait too long. We have been trying to help Paul put the slides up. So thank you for that suggestion. We, we've definitely been trying before we started to show the slides. So apologies about that. And it's great to see Paul back. So we will go straight back to Paul now. So okay. over. Sorry, uh, am I back now? Yes, you're back. So we, okay. we just lost you as you were going into your second slide. Okay, sorry about that. I'm sure it's my fault. The second slide is an image of uh, the well-known image of the attack, uh, the artillery attack on the Ukrainian uh, nuclear power plant. And the title is Sitting Ducks. And the, the point about that, of course, is that Events in Ukraine demonstrate that military backdraft from state or non-state bad actors dovetails with nuclear safety. Now, that's why uh, it's important for all of us. Uh, for example, all UK civil nuclear infrastructure is uniquely implicated in all four tier one threats in the UK national security strategy. And there's a link to that. There's a link to sort of government uh, document on that. What that means, of course, is that wherever you are, uh, nuclear is unfortunately uh, a, a sitting duck. And of course, which brings us to the issue of dual use technology. Now, my colleagues, uh, esteemed colleagues at Sussex University, Professor Andy Sterling and Dr. Phil Johnston have for a long time discussed this issue about civil and military nuclear links. And uh, when CND publish uh, this PowerPoint presentation, there's a link to a substantive aspect of their work. So you can look at it and see what they have to say. Also questions about nuclear military lock-in. So once, once the, 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 new, the military aspect of nuclear is locked into the civil aspect, uh, as in say France and the UK, it's very difficult to untangle. There's a link to that. And also there's a link to a report that I wrote about Gulf nuclear ambition, which looks at potential reasons why uh, certain states in the contested uh, Gulf region may be seeking uh, uh, civil nuclear in the first instance in order to potentially think about uh, military nuclear uh, later. Now, getting back to uh, the issue in hand, 
uh, the one that uh, has caused a lot of sleepless nights for, for all of us, I suppose, uh, uh, but uh, is uh, uh, the Russian-Ukraine war. And the notion, uh, for some reason, that uh, nuclear can save us from, from, uh, from this debacle. Uh, the reality is, of course, is that uh, the UK itself doesn't, doesn't import too much of, of Russia, Kaza Russia uh, gas, uh, whereas, of course, Europe does. But key to this is that Russia and Russian-controlled Kazakh, Kazakhstan supplies, supply 42% of, of the world's uranium for nuclear reactors. So this issue about, uh, and uh, the EU imports 20% of their uranium feedstock for, for, for the reactors from Russia and Russia controlled uh, Kazakhstan. So this notion that, that uh, uh, this new uh, horrendous war is just a gas issue is, is fallacious. Uh, it's, it's absolutely a nuclear issue, which, which is sort of extraordinary that uh, this is now being spun as a sort of a, almost a good news uh, 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 nuclear story, you know, that we now have to up our, our, our nuclear. Now, Boris Johnson is, is, is perhaps looking askance to, you know, France's, uh, you know, nuclear par excellence and saying, well, look, you know, we want to be like them. But right now, 25 of France's 56 reactors are offline. And French electricity spot price has hit a high. That's three times the cost of UK electricity and eight times the cost that in Germany. Now, there are investigations into cracking in safety critical pipe work for nine reactors. And those problems could extend to its entire reactor fleet, which may be, could mean that EDF will, will be faced with operating reactors with serious safety issues just to avoid uh, lights out. Now, meanwhile, EDF says it expects to lose 26 billion this year, but this may still be you know, a serious underestimate. So perhaps Treasury's fiscal concerns about new nuclear should be taken more seriously. Well, unfortunately, as we've learned, and horrendously, as we've learned, Boris goes to Toy Town. And there's an image of a 1950s uh, sort of toy uranium uh, box. But getting back to more serious matters, Johnson is, is fishing for, you know, 14, 14 new nuclear reactors to make uh, the UK into a, a, a little toxic garden. Now that's up from uh, eight gigawatt now to a 24 gigawatts by by 2050 and Johnson has ever jokes uh, yeah and that's not simply large nuclear but it's also so-called small or small modular reactors and jo Johnson in his normal way joked and has actually joked quote one SMR in every labor constituency now, this nuclear push involves the liberalization of planning, environmental and local democratic accountability rules and norms. Certainly planning liberalization, industry are seriously worried about environment agency and marine organization input, specifically because of, of climate impact on, on nuclear. But the key here is it's looking very much like that there will be uh, further limitations on local democratic uh, accountability in terms of locating uh, these reactors, whether they be large or whether they be so-called uh, uh, small modular reactors. And this is a very big, very big issue. Now, uh, the reality is the market has said no to nuclear. Nobody, you know, the investment market won't touch nuclear with a barge pole. So there's this fiscally dexterous uh, UK Parliamentary Nuclear Energy Finance Act, which has passed now to enable a RAB, the, the, the regulated asset base mechanism. And there's links to this. Now, what RAB does is that it puts the UK electricity consumers and taxpayers on the hook for the huge nuclear costs and overruns. And we know that there will be huge. 
And this is because everywhere that new nuclear is being built, it's hugely over cost, it's hugely over time, and it's hugely expensive in any case. And, and, and you'll see the, the comparison between nuclear costs and renewable costs uh, later on. And then there's a link to uh, a, a, a nuclear consult uh, discussion on, on, on RAB, uh, the regulated asset based mechanism, what it means uh, and where it's been tried before. Because of course it's been tried before in the US and failed miserably. Um, so in terms of nuclear costs, uh, Lazard, which is, quote, you know, the world's leading financial advisory and asset management firm. It's a blue, everyone, everybody believes in Lazard. In terms of cost per megawatt hour, solar per megawatt hour, 29 euros. Land wind, 33 euros per megawatt hour. CCS gas, 52 euros per megawatt hour. Coal, 94 euros per megawatt hour and nuclear, a stonking 145 euros per megawatt hour. And below that is the link to, to Lazard's report, which cannot be disputed. Everybody believes in Lazard. Uh, and there's now a graph which really makes it clear, which you will be able to see. And the heading is nuclear can only be built with massive public subsidy. And if I were to sort of uh, somehow try to, to mimic the graph, basically what you see since uh, 2012, uh, the costs for wind and solar have just done that. And literally, they've done that. Gas has kind of been a kind of stable, coal is kind of stable up here, and nuclear has risen like that. And once again, there's a reference to Lazard, and the date for this is 2021. So in terms of the market, the game is over. Nuclear can only be built with massive public subsidy. And now just to turn to the, the issue that I'm sure you all know about, which is the question of waste. And there's, an, there's a, a nice little picture of a, a sort of a jokey waste thing that you'll be able to see. But it, 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 in a more serious sense, and the heading is don't do the crime if you can't do the time, UK's nuclear waste legacy is 700,000 cubic meters of toxic waste. That's 6,000 double-decker buses. Most is stored at Sellafield. And as the UK Office for Nuclear Regulation says, one of the most complex and hazardous nuclear sites in the world. And there's a link to that, to that where that quote comes from. In terms of the money, the UK Nuclear Decommissioning or Authority, the cost of decommissioning and storing current UK rad waste is 131 billion that we owe ourselves, that we haven't paid yet. And current estimates for a GDF, uh, uh, you know, a, a nuclear dump, an unproven nuclear disposal facility uh, is 53 billion, no doubt uh, about to double. So conservatively, that's 200, that's, you know, near on 200 billion. More realistically, 200, 250 billion. And when one considers that sum in relation to uh, the cost of, of, of uh, a public borrowing to, to get us through the last year or so, uh, it, 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 it's an absolutely staggering figure. And there are links to these numbers, so you can verify them. What's also hugely concerning is that nuclear is on the front line of, of, of climate change and not in a good way. As extreme climate events become the norm, current defenses become obsolete. And unfortunately, uh, coastal and inland nuclear will be, uh, is likely to be one of the first and most significant casualties to ramping climate change. So nuclear is quite literally on the front line of climate change and, and not in a good way. And there's a link to, uh, uh, to the, my report on that. Um, the problem is that all recent scientific data says ramping sea level means faster, harder, more destructive storm and storm surge, bringing into question the operational safety, security and viability of coastal nuclear. And that's not simply a UK problem since 41% uh, of all nuclear worldwide is coastal based, is by the coast. Inland nuclear has other problems, severe wildfire, episodic flooding, alternating with low river flow, 
and raised water temperature impacting reactor cooling and discharge. So whether it's by the coast or whether it's by the, the, the sea, uh, uh, it looks within, it's beginning to look like within two decades, uh, we may have significant problems with nuclear climate. Uh, the UK Institute of Mechanical Engineers, not often given to um, uh, propounding counter nuclear arguments in 2008, and it's still, and there's a link to it, you can still find this report, quote, existing and proposed new UK reactors together with their spent nuclear fuel and radioactive waste stores are increasingly vulnerable to sea level rise, flooding, storm surge, and quote, nuclear islanding, with UK coastal nuclear sites needing considerable investment to protect them against rising sea levels and even, quote, uh, in the long term, relocation or abandonment. Now, that was uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers in 2008, and there's a link to that. By the way, uh, key to all of this in the near future is storm surge. Storm surge is when certain atmospheric conditions meet a high tide and basically the sea just basically ups and moves inland. And that will be the key issue in the next uh, decade or two because one expects that sea level rise will be stepwise but storm surge will be other. Now the US Army War College, and again there's a link to this where you can, where you can fact check it, states that nuclear is at high risk of temporary or permanent closure due to climate threats with 60% of US nuclear vulnerable to sea level rise, severe storms and cooling water issues. Now, this is a doozy of a map here that I've got. Uh, it's basically Dungeness Annual Flood Risk 2050. And it's, uh, it's extrapolated from uh, a perfectly reasonable peer-reviewed uh, uh, set of reports and uh, quite a number of people are, are leaning on these maps now and in this map basically Dungeness is it's just underwater it's below water level and significantly below water level uh, at least once a year uh, by by 250 and by a, a very significant margin um, the next map is again from the same uh, data set. It's a climate central uh, data set, uh, which also shows that sizewall B and uh, uh, planned sizewall C will be almost, is likely to be, at least the, map, the, the model suggests, it's very likely to be almost completely surrounded by flood water at least once a year uh, by 2050. Um, so, uh, merrily skipping on to uh, uh, the next issue of, of so-called small modul modular reactors, which uh, Boris Johnson is, uh, is claiming will, will, will be everywhere in the UK. Um, the reality about small modular reactors is that they have the same pollution, uh, nuclear waste and emissions per kilowatt hour as large reactors per kilowatt hour, which is the key here. And they have significant safety, security, and proliferation problems. Uh, the safety problem is because, because they're, they're more compacted, they're not as well separated out. So that their safety, their safety uh, uh, situation is, is more profound. For instance, the, uh, the reactor is closer to the spent fuel and so on and so on. Security problems, uh, that's actually quite a big one as well too. Uh, if they are, if they are smaller, then the, the nuclear island, the, 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 the defense space around it will be smaller, which means it may be more difficult to, 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 uh, to uh, hold back bad actors. But the key also is proliferation problems. The point about uh, small reactors is that uh, if you're going to build them, and we're going to come to the problem of economies of scale and modularization, you have to be able to sell them. It's like you build them cheap and you, well, actually it's not cheap. You build them quick and then, and then you sell them. The question is, who are you going to sell them to? Um, in selling small modular reactors to developing nations, 
is there potential for, for proliferation and do developing nations have the ability to to make them secure and safeguard are there regulation uh, regulatory apparatus uh, up to it now perhaps the, the key sort of thing to get your head around in terms of small modular reactors is that nuclear went big to achieve economies of scale um, big as cheap basically the thing is because of vast upfront investment uh, for an ins you have to have an entire supply chain to replace the economies of scale with the economies of modularization, a factory run. So that to do this, the investment risk is huge, much, much greater than for large reactors. And in terms of the UK, uh, the Rolls-Royce small modular reactor is still in development. They say might the first one might be there for 2030. The point being the Rolls-Royce SMR is not an SMR. It's simply not an SMR. SMRs are about 300 megawatt or less, okay? A large reactor is about 1,000 to 1,500, okay? SMRs are about, say, 300 megawatt less. Now, Rolls's effort is 470 megawatt plus, which makes it about a third the size of a large reactor. So rather like the British slow or blind worm, it's neither slow, blind, or a worm, but a legless lizard. Fusion. Well, the joke for fusion is for the past 70 years, fusion has always been 20 years in the future. Is this an experiment to prove that time doesn't exist in modern physics? And the reality is, is that ITER, which is the only credible fusion project, hopes to light up in 2014. And it won't actually be returning uh, uh, energy by then. Even then, it won't, it's not planning to, to generate more energy uh, than it inputs. So there's been a huge spin on fusion that is profoundly problematic, and there's a link to a discussion on that. Uh, coming towards the end, nuclear is just too slow. It's up to 15 years plus from planning to operation. It can't help with the energy crisis. It's too late to help with the climate crisis. N there's nobody left to dispute the fact that the energy transition heavy lifting will be done by renewables allied with storage, grid upgrade, interconnectors, demand side management, and energy efficiency. So the, the remaining issue for, the, for nuclear is backup or load follow. In other words, you know, so-called intermittency for renewables. But the last thing that you want to back up renewables is nuclear, because nuclear doesn't power up and power down well. It just sort of switches on and then it goes. And then there's, in terms of the baseload argument, the former head of the UK National Grid quote, baseload is an outdated concept, which it is, of course. So wind and solar are growing at a record rate, and there's links to that. The International Energy Agency sort of ri blue ribboned, everybody refers to, quote, renewables will supply 90% of global electric power by 2050. And a link to that. Uh, uh, since 2009, the levelized cost estimates for utility scale solar dropped by 90%, wind dropped by 70%, nuclear increased by 33%, and there's links to that. In Europe, renewables overtook fossil fuels to become EU's main source of electricity in 2020. In 2020. It's 50% cheaper to generate electricity from renewables and fossil fuels, links to that. Uh, EU to increase renewable share in the total energy mix to 40% by 2030 and links to that. So solar and wind are now the cheapest spark power sources in 91% of the world. And the international, you know, it says the International Energy Agency. In 2020, the world added 0.4 gigawatts more nuclear capacity. And that plays against 278 gigawatts of renewables. That's a 782-fold greater capacity on behalf of renewables. So renewables swelled supply and displaced as much carbon every 38 hours as nuclear did all year. And there's a link to that. So um, what we need, uh, one needs to somehow put aside all this rubbish that Boris is talking. Uh, what we need is expansion of renewable energy in all sectors, rapid growth and modernization of the electrical grid, energy conservation and efficiency, rapid evolving storage, market innovation from supply to provision, 
and built and transport infrastructure uh, 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 evolution. Nuclear sucks funds and vital attention from net zero. It displaces renewables on the grid. And it, its costs, which are unimaginably large, compromises the rollout of better, flexible, safe, productive, affordable technologies that, that we have now, which are a huge potential. Energy supply and management from renewables and uh, energy efficiency are huge, have huge potential for job creation, far more than, than, uh, than nuclear. And this is something that the, the, the unions really do need to get their head around. So if you're looking at the evidence base, you know, rather than the, the, the uh, Boris's toy town, uh, we can do better. Uh, nuclear cannot compete uh, with the technological, economic safety and security advantages of the renewable evolution. It's an outdated technology, a, a non-starter in the 21st century, and we certainly can do better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That was excellent. And you covered a lot of ground there. Um, and yeah, just to reassure everybody, I, I've seen the question come up a couple of times. Um, obviously, if people have joined later, Paul does have a presentation that unfortunately he wasn't able to share. And that cert certainly will be made available um, after after this webinar um, when the recording goes out. And, and clearly there's um, some really good links in there, which um, everybody will want to have access to and I particularly like the idea of the picture if you um, can't do the don't do the crime if you can't do the time because I think at the moment we've been told today by the UN IPPC that we have basically got three years left now to um, stabilize um, global temperatures so I, I think that really puts into context a, a lot of what Paul has obviously touched upon in, in terms of nuclear so I'm going to come to the questions. There's a lot of questions and I will apologise in advance if I don't um, call your question out to, to Paul. Um, there's a lot of detailed comments in there. Um, and I suppose I will just go to Tom Muirhead as, as you put the, the first one in the, the chat. But um, this was about how, um, how experts like Paul and colleagues are going to be able to influence government energy policy. Um, and perhaps if sort of linked to that, so I'm just trying to look down, um, you know, and if the government of the opinion we need nuclear power, is that not a de facto admission? We're going to miss our six carbon budget and fail on the, the, the Paris Agreement. Um, and there's a question related to that as well around SMRs um, aren't, about them not going to make any difference as Rolls-Royce are now talking of having their first proof of concept station connected to the grid in the early 2030s. So I, I guess it's just, and, and there have been some questions in the chat as well, just around sort of campaigning perspective. And we can perhaps come to some of those at the end, but just to perhaps pick up that one for now, Paul, and I'll, I'll just come back with a couple of the others. Sorry, I, I, uh, is the issue a question of, of, of nuclear and carbon budget? Is that the question that we're talking about? Yes, I mean, there, there's a, so there's a question about clearly if, if the government's going gung ho for nuclear, um, it feels we've missed the carbon budget. But you know, equally, um, how can we really meet our carbon budget with nuclear as well? Okay. Um, the, the, as discussed, uh, nuclear is incredibly slow and incredibly costly. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's taken up to 15 years for for EDFCPR to 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 to, to come online in in Finland with vast uh, cost overruns. The same will be true of Hinkley. The same will be true of of any other so-called Generation Three reactor. So uh, equally. So-called SMRs, whether they're you know Musk's SMRs or or whether they're Rolls Royce's so-called SMR, which is not an SMR, the, with all the will in the world, they won't be anywhere near ready before 2030, and that's first of a kind, and that's first of a kind. So you're really getting into uh, the mid 30s, and the same is true in France when Macron says he's going to build six EPRs. The reality is, is that he'll build one 
maybe two by the late 30s, maybe. So put that in context of where we are with climate. Uh, and we know that uh, in order to hit our budgets, you know, and the same is true with SMRs. SMRs do, are not operating. SMRs are in development. There's this huge hype that's happened pre and post COP. All of a sudden, everybody is, you know, the press, the media is mad for nuclear. And this is affecting policy in a crazy kind of way. But the evidence base simply does not bear this out. The evidence base says that nuclear is too costly and too slow to help us with the key issue, which is climate. And so uh, then you look at what can be done and the, the what can be done quickly, effectively, cost effectively and practically. And one comes first, the low hanging fruit is energy efficiency, demand side management, energy, you know, then you get to uh, renewables of all kinds. Then you get to grid upgrades, interconnectors, uh, load balancing, uh, and uh, 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 you know, and the rest of it, and clearly storage as well too. So there are ways around. There's no such thing as a free lunch, and we are in a, a huge pickle, of course. But uh, uh, the reality is, is that the renewable evolution really is here. If there is one uh, light at the end of this horrendous tunnel that we're in at the moment, it is that. The market won't touch nuclear with a barge pole. You can only build it with vast public subsidy. How, who's going to pay for it, basically, uh, when nobody's got any money in any case? Meanwhile, renewables are, are, are simply stonking it. Thanks, Paul. I, I think you touched on um, a, a number of points there, which are coming up in some of the other questions um, about how we're going to fill that gap with renewables and the, the base load power. And these are the, the common questions that always come up with, with nuclear. We need firm or base load power. What are we going to do to keep the lights on? And that's a common refrain from the trade unions as well. Um, yes. That, that we need it. So I, I, I think you've um, covered that pretty well and I'm, I'm sure obviously once your slides are circulated as well there'll, there'll be more links to to some of those things um I did want to come back to an earlier question as well um about uranium because mm. I, I I think this, this is quite interesting because yeah. in terms of the energy security discussions now yeah. it's yeah. you know it's it's talked about we're going to have this homegrown energy as though we don't have to import uranium um, it, which is quite bizarre. So I just wanted to particularly just read the question that Ray Street has put, of thinking of uranium. Is there an endless supply and why do proponents of nuclear power ignore what has happened to the uranium miners and their families? <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. Um, it, it's, um, so there's a question, I think, about the supply of uranium. And obviously mm. you touched on some of that around um, coming from Kazakhstan and obviously Russia as well. Um, and there's just a question that has been put specifically about what has happened, you know, also the impact on uranium miners and their families. And obviously that particularly in Australia, where it impacts sure. indigenous, not just there in, in, in Canada as well. So I think that's a, a really important question, which we don't touch on very much around the whole uranium issue. Sure. OK, so uh, first off, uh, the UK uh, won't be affected by. Uh, OK, so just to repeat it because it is an amazing uh, number uh 42 percent of, of of uranium stock worldwide comes from russian control that's russia which has a relatively small amount but russia controls kazakhstan which has a huge amount so it's from russian control if there are if there are if there are blocks on russian control 42 percent goes that includes 20 percent from uh to 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 the eu um, uh, the US hasn't uh, put a ban on Russian uh, uh, specific forms of Russian uranium even now as we speak. Um, uh, is there an endless supply of uranium? No, there isn't. Uh, uranium is finite like everything. And there's work done by uh, Austrian research group that I can share with you, which looks at you know, e even the best sort of will in the world uh, uh, there isn't enough uranium to build this vast amount of, you know, the, the kinds of nuclear that people want to build, basically. Uh, 
Then one turns to questions of the pollution associated with uranium, and it, of course it can be horrendous, whether that's tailings, whether it's airborne, uh, and the impact that it has on, on communities uh, in, uh, in Africa uh, and, and in other places. And also the carbon intensity of uranium mining is also something that's, this notion about nuclear is carbon free is absolutely not true. Nuclear is, uh, one could argue that nuclear is carbon free at point of generation, but the reality is of course, you have to take all of the carbon of uranium mining, processing, transport, building the reactors, uh, operating the reactors, uh, dismantling the reactors, the, the pollution associated with, the waste associated with it, and then, the, the carbon associated with the accidents, and then nuclear is far from uh, uh, far far from carbon free. So yes, there isn't an endless supply of uranium, and uh, uranium is a problem and will be a problem uh, if if uh, if uh, OECD and other uh, if uh, nuclear states abjure uh, Russian controlled uranium. Great, thanks for that really detailed answer. Um, yeah, it's quite, I, I don't know if you know, it's just a question I had to, to be a bit sneaky, dropping one in, but I was actually looking at the accommodation um, issues around Hinkley Point C today, um, because they're, they're gonna hire another 3000 workers and it's just something I hadn't really picked up before is all the infrastructure just for having the workers around a nuclear plant in construction and whether that gets captured within the, the carbon emissions and the, the sort of life cycle of it. Um, don't worry if you don't know the answer, but it just occurred to me today that that was something that I um, hadn't really considered. But um, there has been a question about the design and obviously Hinkley C with um, being the EPR reactor and the problems with that design in China yes. and the, yes. the Tashan. I wanted if you, that there was a question in, um, put in the Q&A about yes. it, whether you could say something about that and the um, possible yes. delays that we might be looking at. Yeah, that's really, that's a very, very, very important question. Now, Taishan, the first EPR to go into operation, so-called, all the EPRs it have, have had huge problems. Adolf Kuliota in Finland and Flammable in France. And then they pointed to say, look, no, here we've got first EPR in Taishan, China. It's operating. Wow, great. Unfortunately, it's shut down now for eight months, and supposedly nobody knows why. You know, and there's all kinds of research going on about it. Is it a problem with a thing called a deflector? Is it a problem with the bottom of the of the reactor pressure vessel? Is it a problem with the fuel rods? And there's huge amounts of. I mean, EDF are having kittens uh, 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 doing the search because it's a it's a it's an enormous issue, and it's incredible. Uh, that the UK press hasn't really gone with it because uh, Hinkley Point C is the same reactor design and the design for size world C is uh, the same uh, uh, same reactor design. So um, I asked uh, Office of Nuclear Regulation, they, they've, they've stonewalled, uh, Caroline Lucas will be asking P uh, parliamentary questions uh, about this and we hope to 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 be getting nearer and nearer uh, to, to, to an answer. But uh, cut a long story short, uh, Taishan EPR has been down for eight months. It has not been generating for eight months, which is enormous and has significant implications. Is there a generic fault? That is the question. Is there a generic fault? There may, there may not be, and it may come down to sort of other forms of details around the, the, the guts of, of the reactor pressure, uh, pressure vessel. But so far, we have absolutely no, no answers whatsoever from ONR, uh, from, from the government, from BIS, or from, uh, or from EDF, who all say, we are looking into the problem. We think it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's okay. But the truth is, is that nobody knows. And this is a very, very important issue. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I think this is possibly an unfair question given the IPPC report just came out today and I suspect you may not have a chance to no, look at it. No, I have, I have. You have, have. okay. Yeah. Um, so someone has asked um, your thoughts on that and mm. what it says in there in relation to, to nuclear. 
because it okay. has in past reports obviously put an emphasis on nuclear power. Excellent. Yes, of course. Um, it, the, the, you know, one has been looking at IPCC work for a long time in the context of nuclear. Clearly, IPC one respects hugely and has been, you know, they've been doing their work. What they do essentially is that they reviewed peer reviewed published papers and then their authors then sort of judge and write about it. If you look, unfortunately, at the, the vast majority of the, of the nuclear related work that they've been looking at, they come from authors that 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 I find potentially problematic. Their, their views, their interpretations, their judgment, uh, their uh, their evidence base. So I think for the first time, what we're seeing is, uh, and it could be a reflection of IPC's worry about uh, the climate crisis, but for the first time, we're seeing quite a, quite a kind of a, top, a nuclear top heavy uh, IPCC report. Uh, it also may reflect the kinds of authors, uh, you know, if I look at the UK authors who, who, you know, they have a certain kind of view associated with guys like Jim Ski and the rest of it. Um, so, uh, and it is in, in contrast to earlier IPCC reports, which were potentially more balanced, which, which they used to say, well, maybe nuclear can help, but there are problems with it kind of thing. And that was the general position. This report seems to be significantly more nuclear top heavy. And that is a problem. And it's, it's a problem because it may not necessarily uh, uh, reflect uh, the evidence base. It may more significantly reflect the kinds of evidence they were looking at and their interpretation of it. But I've only glanced at it but so far, uh, it, it looks uh, uh, slightly worrying, to be honest. Thank you. Well, yeah, and obviously it, it, it's huge um, for, for most of us to, to work through that as well. Um, a, a couple of people have asked about how we can influence at a governmental level. And, and obviously you do sit on various committees and you've mentioned Caroline Lucas. and. I, I suppose for us, you know, particularly as a CND webinar, and we are looking around campaigning on this issue. Um, and obviously, part of this is trying to obviously build our own education and knowledge about the, the technology. Um, so, I wonder if you had any sort of thoughts or um, particular ways of talking about nuclear energy. And somebody had made the point, and I've, I've certainly come across this myself, um, in terms of with environmentalists, it. it it's not like with fossil fuels, nuclear is a very um, still contested issue. Um, so some environmentalists and obviously we know prominent environmentalists like George Monbiot advocate for nuclear, um, which some of us often don't feel was very helpful. Um, and, you know, others don't. So it, it does become quite conflictual. So I just want any thoughts that you you had on that and how we might be able to start to talk about it in a more convincing way and not obviously touching on these issues around storage and, and baseload etc yeah i mean this bit this bit this bit about sort of greens turning to nuclear it it it, it got quite a lot of of, of impacts you know especially with more, more monbia than anyone else and then one looks at the other so-called greens who have turned to nuclear and they really have always been nuclear and a few people who one doesn't really want to have much to do with um, uh, in fact, I remember uh, pre-Fukushima, I was on a Channel 4 uh, uh, program with Monbio. It was me and Monbio and another guy against the so-called Greens who turned nuclear. And Monbio was on our side, and Monbio was laying out very good arguments why nuclear was a bad idea. We slaughtered them. It was a one-hour debate. And at the end of it, we thought, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's great. So one wonders what actually happened to Monbiot. I mean, it, that, that's, that really is a, it's a mystery, actually. I mean, it's a real mystery. And also he seems to publish at particular times when the, the industry are, are potentially in some, in real problem. Fukushima, why would Fukushima make one support nuclear? It doesn't make sense. And then when uh, Russians were, were, were blasting a, uh, 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 a Ukrainian nuclear power plant, Monbiot then again published in The Guardian. So his publications tend to mirror sort of crisis points for nuclear. So one wonders if, essentially, if he's being handled. But in any case, the, uh, 
so this issue about um, Greens going nuclear, it, it's really a non-issue. Uh, the, the vast majority uh, of Greens, the overwhelming majority of Greens, you know, are, 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 are renewable and, and, and counter nuclear for perhaps obvious reasons. Now, in terms of influencing policy, I mean, I've, I've really tried and obviously failed. Um, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I remember I was, um, how does one do it? I mean, I, but I, I came up with the idea, of, well, the only way, I can't get to policy, one can't get to policy. They seem to be intractable and they, they don't seem to think very much, to be honest. And uh, th there's no such thing as an evidence-based energy policy. It, it's just, it's just non-existent. Um, and, uh, so I thought, well, I know what, I'll go to the media and press and maybe influence policy via that. That's to a certain extent has worked, but recently it's actually more and more difficult to get in the media and the press. And that's largely due to uh, what's been happening in the last year. There seems to be an oppress on uh, for, in terms of editorial bias, uh, BBC, uh, even the Guardian now has been publishing some very, very strange things. So in, uh, in terms of policy, I do brief, I am asked to brief and advise uh, front bench, uh, uh, not government front bench, but all uh, um, uh, aspects of other uh, party uh, front bench, but only certain people within those front benches uh, and not to determine policy. Uh, so, you know, of course there, there are these discussions and, and the evidence is presented uh, and then and then politics happens. So at the moment, I like you, I think I'm, you know, quite, uh, you know, it's, 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 it really is, it is a dire situation. You have to call it, you know, you have to call it out. It's a very, very difficult situation. That said, um, one wonders how politically it'll work. And in terms of thinking about the unions as well too, uh, because clearly unions uh, impact hugely labor policy. Labour, by the way, will also need SNP, Green and Lib Dems. When you look at the, the boundary changes, there's no way that Labour's going to do without them. Now, you're not going to change SNP, you're not going to change the Greens, you're not going to change the Lib Dems now in terms of nuclear. Played Cymru, exactly the same as well too. So the politics is, is not stacking up for that. In terms of, of, of the unions, one is in despair why the unions might be so gung-ho for nuclear when it is obvious. I mean, the evidence is absolutely clear that the jobs are with renewables and uh, energy efficiency and demand side management. I mean, it, it is simply, it's not even a question anymore. That is simply what is happening. So in terms of where the money, you know, where the money for the jobs are, that's where the jobs are. Now, money is not a free good. You, you spaff it on nuclear. You can't spaff it on the stuff that you really need to do and you will lose those jobs. So perhaps part of this is uh, create, creative, constructive discussion with you. Say, so, well, look, here is the evidence. Can, you know, can you please look at it? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I think many of us would like to do that, and we've certainly been trying um, for a long time to have that. And, and you know, and it's no secret that our, our movement is very much split on this question of nuclear power, and um, that was borne out, um, particularly at TUC. Uh, last year as well, um, thinking my own union is opposed to nuclear power. But um, the other point to come back to, in which you raised sort of near the beginning of your talk, and I don't think we could sort of end without touching on this, is the link between obviously nuclear power and the military side. Um, yeah. And of course, we, we haven't, you, you talked about the work of um, Andy Sterling and Phil Johnson, which is really yes. fantastic and certainly recommend everybody to have a look at what they've done. And, and I think because they, they've really studied in depth about that policy shift, which um, happened around the mid 80s, I think it was, um, where even the, you know, what was then Sustainable Development Commission was ruling out nuclear. And then suddenly the Labour Party was in power did a, a shift. But um, I suppose really, you know, how much you think is being driven by that and you know Johnson had made these announcements last year about increasing the nuclear um, warhead supply as well so I, I think um, that's something that um, is also useful just to touch on before we finish. Yes, 
it, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an absolute truism. I mean, it's, it, it, it goes without saying. Uh, you know, it is a military nuclear industrial complex. I mean, that's clearly what it is. I mean, it, it, it's almost too obvious to say. Um, Macron has also, you know, said the same thing. The, the, the paradox is, of course, is that even if you wanted to have uh, a nuclear military, uh, say the UK or whatever, it would be cheaper to run that, to ring fence it. Now, this is not what Andy Sterling and, and Phil Johnson argue. Uh, that's not their view. It's my view. And, and uh, it is that I believe it would be cheaper to ring fence that and do away with civil. They make clearer the link between uh, military and and uh, and and civil nuclear, uh, and and their arguments are basically hugely compelling. Uh, they're also compelling in terms of what's going on in the Gulf, which I've written about and have links to in in my PowerPoint, whether that's Iran, UAE, or Saudi, uh, you know, uh, especially Saudi now, you know, who've made clear that 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 you know, a uh, civil nuclear will be a step to, to military nuclear for them. And then one comes to a, uh, a, 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 a the, the potential for a, 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 uh, an arms race in the Gulf and potential proxy exchanges. I mean, the unimaginable thing, of course, is that, of course, Russia and, and America wouldn't necessarily seek to exchange ballistics, but they, they wouldn't necessarily mind if Saudi and Iran did. So there's this issue about whether it protects or whether it doesn't. And it's just, uh, you know, it's just one of these horrendous questions that there is absolutely no answer to. Um, but it is absolutely clear that there is an absolute link. I mean, it's, it's you don't have to be a, you know, um, world-class ac you know, academics like Andy and Phil to, 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 you know, to come up with that one. Uh, what they do is they lay it on the line and, and they provide the evidence uh, that, you know, so much is true. Thank you, Paul. Um, we're just coming up towards um, eight o'clock now. We were due to um, finish at eight. I know we, we unfortunately had a bit of delay with some of our tech issues as well. So um, I just say, if, is there any final comments you want to make, Paul? I, I'll just leave it to you. I mean, perhaps any questions you've seen or points you feel that are, are worth addressing or going over? Okay, I mean, there's been too many questions to, to read, and I've been concentrating on trying to answer. I think that for me, and I think perhaps for others, is that it's a very difficult moment. I mean, it really, I mean, there, there are all kinds of problems, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, the threat of that in, in, a, in a military sense, um, or whether it's this sort of this, this new flavor of the month that nuclear will save us from climate, which it obviously won't. And of course, the issue of climate itself. But I would like to emphasize, and uh, you know, as clearly as I can, that the renewable evolution—it's uh, not coming; it's here. Uh, there, there is—you know, you will not find an energy professor, not a, a, a nuclear materials professor, but an energy professor who says otherwise. Okay, renewables and and the rest of it will be doing the heavy lifting, and this will change this will change the nature of things this will change the nature of our relationship with ourselves it'll also change the nature of our relationship with the environment when we switch the power on we'll know that that power comes from a renewable source that is not polluting us that is not killing us and that will change things it's also in terms of of, of, of geostrategic uh, political and military issues um there's been very few wars recently that haven't been uh, energy wars or pipeline wars. Ukraine might be even one of those for, for certain kinds of reasons. It's actually quite difficult to fight over wind and sun. So that may have also uh, potential geopolitical, strategic military implications as well too. So for all kinds of reasons, despite the fact that we are in a bit of a hole at the moment, there is enormous cause for hope. Thank you. And I think we always want to end on a feeling of hope because we certainly need to have that. Um, I have seen it, somebody put in a question about having more webinars. That's certainly what we intend to do. And I think, um, as I said at the beginning, for those who may have missed it, this is the first in what we hope will be a short series of webinars around the nuclear question, trying to understand the technology better. And I think Paul has excellently outlined that trying to understand some of the, the issues around jobs and what small modular reactors mean in reality, 
and a, a third webinar we're hoping to look at is around some of the health and safety and risk aspects, both obviously for communities living around nuclear plant, but also around the uranium mining sectors as well and the impacts on workers. So I think it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you for giving such in-depth answers and, and responses, um, Paul. We really have appreciated your time and thank you for everybody who's participated and all the questions. And yes, we do need to start campaigning and doing whatever we can because we, we've got a very, very big nuclear lobby out there at the moment, which we really need to be standing up against. So thank you all very, very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.